It is an honor to be here this evening and an honor to serve on the Fairhope Single Tax Board. I've been on the board for 12 years and um, I come up this time and I'm probably going to run again. Can you hear? Oh, oh now you can. Okay. Um, I first heard about or read about Henry George when I was in my gra grandmother's attic reading my great-grandmother's diary. And she was fascinated with Henry George. And so I became fascinated with Henry George as we dressed up in her uh, wedding dress of the 1890s. <laughs> um, and so growing up, when it was time for me to do papers in, in high school and college, I wrote about Henry George because nobody in the South knew who he was. <laughs> and then I came to Fairhope to visit and realized that this was the colony that my great-grandmother wrote about that was going to be uh, set up in the South somewhere. So uh, that is my early, early uh, remembrance of Henry George. And th this colony was uh, formed um, on his ideals and his ideas. And, um, and we have been very fortunate that we have been able to continue, um, maybe not like they did in 1894, the way they envisioned it because of the way things changed politically. But we have managed to do a great deal for this community. I, I think I have live mic on, oh, so good. I can do it. Hi, um, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here and to see some of you whom I saw uh, when I spoke earlier and who've had, I think, an occasion to be here a number of times. Um, two, well, just two pre-notes. Um, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching at Spring Hill College since January of 1974. And it does occasionally worry me that I speak over the heads or of my audience or classes and rather than to them. And uh, it occurs to me that in this wind-up um, uh, get-together that you interrupt really as soon as you're disposed to interrupt. Uh, you've probably all been at public uh, discussions of one kind or another or classes where individuals have uh, put up their hands and said, maybe it's just me, but, and they go ahead and ask, uh, ask the question. And my perception is usually a good two-thirds of the class, uh, if that occurred to that person at that particular moment of um, intellectual conversation, enjoyment, uh, it's occurred to other people too. So um, if you do interrupt, uh, literally interrupt and uh, ask questions, uh, perhaps we will speak to you and not to uh, foreordained um, thoughts or whatever. I know Carol does want to talk about um, something of a catalog or a list of things that the Single Tax Corporation has done. So that may be something that will um, one might allow that to develop so that the material gets out there on the, uh, on the table. But I thought I would at least start with um, Henry George's most eloquent um, way of talking about the legitimacy of single tax and uh, what was the mentality that launched uh, the single tax experiment. Okay, and in uh, Progress and Poverty, which is a, uh, you know, it's, well, it's uh, night hall is what it is. Uh, so if you ever have trouble sleeping, you might try reading parts of um, Progress and Poverty. But there are some electrifying aspects to it. And he wrote with uh, really a late 19th century, almost biblical sense of, uh, of expressive prose. So there's some really beautiful sections. And one that's really notable and relevant uh, is basically saying, at a time when there's no graduated income tax. So let's presume that the mentality of single tax is no, uh, no graduated income tax, okay? It's been tried several times by constitutional amendment preceding the 1890s and has failed and did not pass until 1913. So the corporation is launched as a colony in 1894, okay, so it's almost 20 years before we have a graduated income tax. So no income tax. So how are you going to run the common wheel? How are we going to run a town? 
what's the source of it? So it's not going to be excise taxes, which are for federal, and minimal taxes of other kinds. How are you going to do that? Well, Henry George's thought was to make this personal, all of us, okay, and sadly this prescinds from the existence and the rights and the prepossession of the Native Americans, but all of us arrive, and this is literally what Henry George says, we arrive in an undeveloped savanna. Okay, now that's not Savannah, Georgia. It's going to be somewhere where uh, uh, it is completely undeveloped. Uh, there's water there, there are trees there, but there are no people there at all. There's no transcontinental railroad. There's nothing to make the land have value. And we decide to set up an establishment there. We're in a wagon train going the Oregon Trail or whatever, and we, we all of us here now, we all say, enough with the wagons already. Okay. Uh, at any rate, so we stop there. The land is available through the federal government free. It's free because nobody can put any kind of price on it because it's not really worth anything. There's so much of it. Okay. We build a town. Okay. Now let's just say a Rockefeller or a Vanderbilt or someone is with us and he or she uh, gets his or her section of land and then goes on to California. Okay. The rest of us build a town. Because some of us are, as with the founding of Fairhope, uh, competent in, uh, as, uh, as, uh, uh, with lumber to build houses, some of us are shopkeepers, some of us are farmers, some of us run a dairy, which was true, of course, in the founding of Fairhope, and all of that. So we create a town, okay? So the land rises in value, okay? And the value of the land has been created by the community, okay? So, the, what single tax says is we're not going to have any taxes except we're going to tax the rising value of the land which everybody creates to provide services for everybody. So there's a logic that the town has created the rising value, the town harvests, think of it almost as a crop, the, the, the town harvests that property and returns it to the common wheel. Now, a hundred years later, the Rockefeller or Vanderbilt descendant comes back to our town. And he or she has land that he or she has contributed zero to its improvement. Can he or she sell that land for quadruple, ten times what it was originally worth? I'm not saying uh, here, you may have heard that Bayfront land was $6 an acre and downtown land was a dollar and a quarter an acre in 1894, okay? So he, the Vanderbilt comes back and gets 10 times that. He has contributed nothing to the rising value of the land, okay? Does the community have the right to harvest the rising value of that land? Again, there's no uh, graduated income tax. So that's kind of the rationale behind it. And it, it may seem a little grabby, but it's not really grabby because the community is harvesting what the community created, okay? So something is happening that a whole community has created and that is being harvested by the community to be reinvested into the community. Okay, so that's the rationale behind whether the single tax uh, has, has the, the right because it, ha it holds title to about 4,500 acres in Fairhope, which at the beginning of the, of the uh, right before the bust in 2008, was worth about $250 million. So we're talking a quarter of a billion dollars the land is worth to which the single tax corporation holds title and upon which it has paid taxes for 120, 130 years, okay? So that leads us then to the whole issue of the, the harvesting of value which the community has created when there is a widening of Highway 181 or whatever else. Okay, namely what rights, but that's recognizing also the rights of the women and men who have a leasehold, a 99 year leasehold to that, perhaps have a business there. There are all kinds of values which they have indeed invested and deserve to be reimbursed for. But that image of the undeveloped savanna 
is kind of a critical moment in progress and poverty when Henry George, and I can remember in college or somewhere, somebody talking about HMT. You always have to be careful when somebody has an HMT, which is a high moral tone, okay? <laughs> and the high moral tone behind all of this is who created that value, who has a right to that value, does the community have a right to harvest a value which it, the community, has created and which is a workable source of income to run a community, okay? That all changed, of course, in 1913 when the graduated income tax came in and all of a sudden Fairhope single tax is one more, uh, you know, it sounds like one more tax. A final comment, one could say recognizing that the members of the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation take an oath to gain nothing from their membership or leadership or whatever in the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation. So you possibly could look at the property of the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation, okay, as a real estate mutual fund, okay, whose income is reinvested into the community. In other words, the income from that uh, real estate mutual fund is not harvested by the membership or the leadership of the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation. It is reinvested into the community. And that perhaps sets up Carol uh, to talk about what the corporation has done across these uh, many years since its founding. What is it, 120? 120. So. Well, I think that one of the most important, you're sitting in a place that we funded, uh, the museum. But talking about the beginning, when you look at the land that they bought, something that George and I have both talked about, uh, the land that they accrued for Fairhope single tax in the beginning, they also paved these streets that we have. That they, they Fair up single tax, we as a community received no taxes from that. We, we, we gave that land. That land is to our benefit. The infrastructure that we have uh, is, is the benefit to this community. Um, in 1931, we gave the parks away, and, and uh, we didn't give them away. We, we deeded them to the Fairhope, uh, city of Fairhope. Uh, in perpetuity to be kept as parks. And I believe that's sure. a yes. common word that we use is in perpetuity. The same thing with the uh, land uh, behind the library. In perpetuity, it could not be made into condominiums, let's say. It has to be used for citywide um, things. We've talked about possibly putting some type of grass parking area there that would benefit all of us as we get older and we have to park away from where we want to go. Um, and in 1932, we gave the city of Fairhope the deed to the wharf. Um, and then we also gave the city the original utilities. Um, and when you think of that now, <laughs> what was given on behalf of the whole community, realizing, of course, that there are um, it benefits everyone in the community, not just the leaseholders. Um, so th those are things that people forget about that we, other than things like the museum that you can go to or come to the library and see, uh, all along um, we've uh, continued to support a library um, and um, all along we've continued to support arts. I, when I think about health, education, and welfare, um, we've supported the schools. We can talk about specific projects if you want to. Um, we've, we've supported, um, of course, all the history with the bay boats. We've supported that. Um, it, there was a talk about that two, two times ago that we talked about the bay boats um, that came here, the history. We, we protected the history. We're in the process now of digitizing all of our archives that we have and eventually that we hope that will be online where people can study and, and, and look at this great place that, that Fairhope Single Tax has contributed to. 
I want to talk about a major project that we get a lot of complaints about, and that's the giving to Thomas Hospital. Um, we, we have complaints uh, that Thomas Hospital is no longer a hometown hospital. And um, since I have been on the board, I have voted to give to the emergency room and to the birthing center. And I'll just tell you my reason for doing that as a director. I, in my business, I raise a lot of children and I have um, around 70 families. 60 of those families live on single tax land. So I'm sort of a go-to person when they don't, when they, they don't understand their bill. <laughs> and we talk about the fact that I, don't, I have professional, I have teachers that uh, bring their children. I have um, a couple of lawyers. I have, but mostly I have, I have a mother that's a welder. So I have good old Fairhope people. Um, they want to have a safe place to take their children uh, if they're sick in the middle of the night. And as a director, I felt that that was an important thing. And I know there are complaints. There are complaints about any, any type of medical <laughs> facility. So, but I felt like that that was an important thing for Fairhope, granted, uh, we give the money to the foundation, which is solely for Fairhope. So while, yes, Mobile Infirmary is the big guy, most small town hospitals are owned by big guys. We have a luxury here because we do have the foundation, and the foundations, everything stays here in Fairhope. Um, we have just pledged money to the new birthing center. There again, that affects my business. I have, uh, Mayor Kent came to our 4th of July parade and he turned around and he said, there are 15 women here, pregnant women. And <laughs> he said, are you drumming up business? I said, well, yes. <laughs> but when you think about that, these people, they are over, uh, I guess they call their numbers, overstocked <laughs> um, at the hospital on 4-3, 30% sometimes. So, so this is something that enhances this community. And it also brings in good doctors. When they see that you have a fabulous facility, a fabulous emergency room, a fabulous birthing center. Um, it encourages even heart doctors to come. So that is my reason for feeling that we are, um, hospitals and schools are two of the most important things that people think about when they move into an area. And if you think people are not moving into this area, you should look at my waiting list. I have people that call me from Minnesota that are moving down here to God's country. So I, I just, that's how I plan, think about my vote uh, when, when I do vote. And we do get complaints. Yes, sir. Yes, I can. I'm not, um, he wanted to know how projects come to the board and how they're decided on. Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, oftentimes, projects just show up because they think we're gonna give money out to everybody. And that is not so. Um, we, we make an effort to see what, and we try to work too with the city. We've just done a big study on things that people wanted. Uh, we, we've had the community come on um, February the 14th and, and we, we marked things that we would like to, to ha see done. Uh, we invited lessees to come and members to come. And we had a fair showing of that. And then we're still in the process. The city is working on things that they would like to do. But in the past, usually people just came to us and said, you know, would you help with this? Um, 
we have always helped with sidewalks. So if someone has come in and asked uh, that a sidewalk be put in, and we know it's going to affect single lessees uh, or on single tax land, we have always made an effort to put those sidewalks in. And we have continually been doing that. Um, when Thomas Hospital just comes and asks, and they come and talk to us about specific things that they might do or ideas that they have. Um, it, there was a year in the making when we talked about the birthing center, the same thing with the emergency room. They discussed, yes ma'am. Um, what percentage of the birthing center cost would you may have, have uh, given money for? Would it have been the whole amount needed or a portion? Well, they'll ask for the, a top dollar. You know, and we usually um, we we talk about it. We discuss that among our you know among the board. Um, I think that we um, with we gave a million dollars to the emergency room, and we gave, we pledged a million to the birthing center. That didn't pay for all of it. No, it will not pay for all of it, and Mobile Infirmary will come up with the rest of that. But what we put in stays here. It will not go to any other project that Mobile Infirmary is doing. They're going to be putting in an urgent care center out past 181, I believe. With that, will have, we, none of that money will go. It will go for what we specific. We're very specific when we give the money as to what it's for and to how it's to be used. And if it's not used for that, they don't get it. So, yes. I, I can speak. Um, does anybody know uh, of how much the hospital had to raise or the uh, open heart surgery, how much it was? Because we, we, we don't come anywhere near 100% of it. And of course, uh, uh, families here like the MAPS have donated substantial amounts, and the foundation has a fundraising, uh, you possibly have all heard that, that when a, uh, uh, a campaign is announced, uh, the outfit already has 60% of it. Uh, through big donors and things like that. So uh, we were contacted by the hospital for three major projects across the last 15 years, uh, and therefore we were part of their initial conversation and would get an amount. But I'm not sure, I think your original question was what percentage did we give? And I don't know what the final version of it was, but whatever Mobile Infirmary, Mobile Infirmary, by the way, picked up a $40 million debt that Thomas Hospital had before um, Mobile Infirmary became the primary uh, overseer of the hospital. But the foundation does indeed run its own campaigns, and that, of course, is a substantial contribution. And, 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 and they work with us. They'll come and talk to us. It's a year, usually, or you know, at least eight months that we've, we talk about. Uh, what we could do. The same thing with the schools. When the schools ask us for something, we spend a lot of time and a lot of study as to how it will affect lessees um, and members alike and the community. Um, will, will we be able to, you, you know, how it's going to affect everybody here in the community. Carol, can I say something else? And, and I also, I'll be honest with you, I give it really kind of prayerful consideration. Um, as to how it will affect everybody, and of course affect, um, I mean, I'm talking about the whole community. I was gonna to respond to Mike's question, though, also about the procedure for submitting or for finding worthy causes. And I think the old fashioned expression is a lot of it comes over the transom. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, Mike is our treasurer and would know that we're in the midst of, uh, and Carol has, uh, um, champion for a number of uh, uh, meetings now, the formation of a strategic planning committee, which we had about 15 years ago, which led to the uh, amending of the Constitution, which takes a 75% affirmative vote, so it's not done easily. At any rate, um, I think that strategic planning process is to regularize this so that there, there isn't, and it might be a concern of many of you, and perhaps Mike, it might be with yours or Mike's uh, thoughts on this, is uh, um, are there pet projects 
Okay, and certainly institutionally, something as what Carol mentioned, like uh, uh, um, uh, things that will improve the uh, amenities and the needs of our lessees. So sidewalks and paving projects, and very often uh, the city will have a project of some kind and will supply the raw materials if the city will supply labor. So that's what created the um, soccer and softball park behind the new high school. I guess uh, it's a sign of age for me to say the new high school, but the high school, the <laughs> yes, Fairhope the High School. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, we donated $125,000 for the land there, which is now of a quality of softball that uh, Spring Hill College was involved with the uh, regional playoffs at one year, and that's where, they, where it was held. Uh, at any rate, we gave 125,000. The land in a year was worth 250. It was worth 650 or so when the city laid out the soccer fields and the uh, uh, softball fields and everything there. So we try to work with the city, uh, of course, too. So in responding to your question, people fire things over the transom, and we say it goes through a process. They'll call a sometimes. Just uh, what do you think? you know, uh, just on our cell phone or something. They'll just say, you know, some, most of the time people make a presentation, they bring it to us, and we're not, we won't vote on it until the next month because we want to have enough time to discuss, the, discuss it. Most people that are asking for large amounts give us quite a bit of time and, um, and, and education um, on what we're, what we're giving to. Um, we, um, we also have developed land and uh, the subdivision there across from the soccer field, we, we did develop that. And some of us would like to see us do some more of that and of course take more park area because usually when we um, have developed land we have planned parks with it uh, as we did across the bay and um, in various areas of Fairhope. So that is a, a, something for the Strategic Planning Committee to discuss and think about is uh, possibly taking money um, and funds and, and developing another subdivision somewhere and, and then making sure, uh, because as we did the soccer fields and we made the subdivision there, then we have the nature park that is out there too. And we're in the process of talking to the city about working something out uh, in making that a municipal park. Other questions, things that you all from across the talks that began in January, were the things that you would like to follow up on, particular questions that you had, because both Carol and I are capable of, of talking. Yes. Sometimes in empty rooms we're found <laughs> Just anima to ourselves. animatedly <laughs> talking. But uh, as you can see, we do that, yes. That would be the number of leaseholds that we have. We have, I think, about 3,000 parcels, and in some cases, given individuals or families, uh, nuclear families, would have a number of different leases. But I'd say it's about 3,000. I remember That's when correct. it was 2,400. But so let's say 3,000. And there are, more, there are more subdivisions going out, at, out past. Um, even 181 are out that way that are single tax land. And that, that might be relevant. We don't have a, a fully accurate, there's been some concern and some insightful uh, contributions for, for a map that would show single tax land, uh, Fairhope land, the boundaries of the uh, town, the, uh, the uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction and things like that that would show, because some of single tax land, the idea in the founding was to start where the pier is now, the wharf, and then extend land across to the railroad line in Robertsdale. So that's why some single tax land goes considerably to uh, our east 
out beyond the city, uh, the city limits. And some of you may know there was an attempt to actually build a railroad and they did about a mile of it and that was, it just wouldn't work. But uh, there actually is, I think parts of it are in the museum uh, that was going to go out that whole way. So the commercial implications were important, but also the sense that that was gonna be single tax land, support single uh, business for the community as a whole. So other questions? Yes. There's a very nice park here. I've heard some of the discussion about water access as you go farther down uh, south of the Peter area. Is, is that an area of argument or is that has anything to do with you? Uh, the land that is presently part of the park, I think, was all owned by the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation and deeded to the city. And we're not in a position generally to acquire new land, okay? And of course, all of that is privately owned and prohibitively expensive right now. So we wouldn't be acquiring that way. And there'd been concern, uh, and Carol touched on this when she talked about the park, if you go out um, um, Twin Beach Road, uh, as far as Highway 13, except for a residence right on the northeast corner, uh, actually it would be the southwest corner of that intersection of Twin Beach Road and 13, there is, how many acres is that park that's out there now? Do we, does anybody know what that is? Freddie, uh, do you know what the, the acreage is? But there was concern that we benefit our lessees who are to the east of uh, Municipal Fairhope and that we have a park out there and there, that's the one that Carol referred to. We're, we're in the process of working with the city on um, the Boy Scout hut is out there now. They we, have a building. We, on they there. have a building there which we help move and um, we, so they have planted trees, uh, uh, longleaf pine, and uh, do somewhat maintain it, uh, but we're in the, and we keep it mowed, but we're in the process of talking to the city and possibly we'll deed that back to the city. They are also in the, the city is in the process of adding a huge soccer complex out off Manly Road, which abuts that, um, that nature park. So we're, um, I think in the next meeting, we're going to be discussing some of that. And we'll, the, the, how we do that, how we deed that park over. The maintenance, of course, is an important thing and an expensive thing. And when the city has the crews and the things to do, to do that, and hopefully we would get some picnic tables or something out there so that everybody out that way could enjoy it. Now we have sidewalks that go there. So it would be one, or almost there. So we're hoping that that will, um, you know, that will help. The, the little strip that we did between that little windy thing that goes between um, uh, Troyer, Troyer, Troyer Road, uh, we, we totally paid for that. So, and that was a safety factor, and we put sidewalks out there for, for kids uh, walking and going back and forth, although I see so many, um, not just children, riding their three-wheel bicycles and everything, walking up and down that shit. Um, what Carol's speaking about, as some of you may know, a Bishop Road, which is just uh, this side of the um, uh, public school complex there on Fairhope Avenue, uh, that the school buses uh, were having to go out onto main, uh, mainline traffic on Greeno Road going back and forth. So when we extended or uh, contributed to the extension of Bishop then uh, connects with Booth, which then goes down to the high school. And in between, there was an undeveloped area with some very large and beautiful live oaks. And the point was people didn't want to total the oaks in the name of having a straight line. So we basically uh, worked extensively with the city and the county on that. So now school buses can go from the primary school, the elementary and middle school, to the high school back and forth without going out onto uh, Greeno Road. And of course, private uh, cars and bicycle and walking traffic. And it does wind around because it's avoiding those large oaks. So the whole thing was both scenic and safety oriented and we hope beautiful. And it and it took us about 20 years to working on that. That 
you know, we, we were the force behind that and we kept saying we, we feel like that needs to be done. And it did take us quite a while to get, the, get it all worked out. So, um, you know, we don't just hop into something, but, but occasionally we, we know we have a good idea and we see a thing that can really help our lessees or can help the community. And safety is a big issue uh, with us that we, we would like for things to be safe for people. Carol, you said something, and it's, uh, I don't know that this has actually come up as a specific point since January, but when Carol said it took 20 years to work that out, um, some of you that have read something about the history of Fairhope and might know some things about current uh, experiences of Fairhope is the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation has been to a higher percentage, I think, than other populations, peopled by curmudgeons. And when you have curmudgeons and a high moral tone, <laughs> you have huffy uh, statements of who's right and why they are right. And, and any, we're curmudgeons. And anybody who disagrees <laughs> is not only ignorant, but immoral. And uh, that has surrounded occasional controversies, uh, yes, recent as well as distant. And sometimes uh, our meetings are spirited on that front. And sometimes uh, it, it has been awkward. Uh, but if you read, there's a blue book that you can pick up at the uh, Fairhope Single Tax Office called um, uh, uh, Fairhope 19, 1894 to 1954, colon, a single tax colony, uh, which it was until 1904, and then it became the corporation. Uh, the single tax was incorporated. But at any rate, you'll read about lots of uh, funny people, and of course Dean Mosier so nicely in uh, our most recent talk uh, talked about the, the artists and artsy people and other kinds of strange carryings on that were part of the founding of Fairhope and continue. So I mean that's just an anecdote, but it may explain when you say, well, like we hear every so often, why are those people always fighting with each other? And why do they throw this person out of the corporation or, or have a movement to throw somebody out or what have you? And it's always attended by a great deal of self-righteous uh, uh, rhetoric on one side or the other, which can look unfortunate and can even look a little ugly, but it's been around since 1894. I uh, mentioned uh, Paul Gaston who wrote that uh, uh, dark uh, covered uh, uh, pamphlet that you have there in your seats. And his uh, grandfather was thrown out of office at least once. Uh, there were just all kinds of arguments about things. They were furious about that when the telephone came in that only the wealthy, the telephone was for the wealthy and everybody was being taxed for it and this was immoral and uh, expropriating the, the penniless and all the rest of that. So, but other questions that you might have uh, that you all would like to ask. Um, well, you're leasing the land, and so your lease, you don't, you, you release that, or you, that lease goes to someone else. Your house is your improvements, and so that belongs to you, and, um, and, and that's the difference. I had a young couple come and ask me about single tax, and I, and I explained it to them this way. Um, when I started out as a 20-something year old in my business, and I looked for single tax land, Dean Mosier and I were friends, and he said, you know, that's the way to go. I have used that three acres of land to its fullest. I have a gym on it, I have two pools on it uh, through the years. The, the reason that I thought it was ad good for me, advantageous for me, was being a small business, I'm allowed to pay my tax that's due in December ahead of time. And I can pay it in increments. 
Well, when you're budgeting and you just started out in the business, that's an excellent way to get started. At, because you know you're gonna have to pay that property tax and uh, the tax on your improvements at the end of the year. And that's a large amount of money. So for, for a small business, you have an opportunity to pay ahead. And um, they said, oh, we never thought about it that way. Why, because we're having to pay tax on it. And I said, well, if you leased a, a piece of land, just a piece of deeded land, you would pay, you could pay anywhere from 10% um, to 6% for your lease. You're, you, for your single tax lease, you're only paying 0 0.002. So you're not having to pay the full amount that a deeded person would have to pay if they leased a piece of land or a building. So that's something that is advantageous, but when you go to pay your taxes, sometimes people think, well, I have to pay this .002, and then you pay an administration fee of $100, and that's for running the office to keep up with these 3,000 leases that we have to keep up with. Um, our office staff does a great job, and, and it's, um, it's not easy. And people, yes. I was going to say, that when we taught the class uh, last year in this building, um, the uh, economics class and the class that people take if they're interested in membership, someone f uh, asked the question, and we hadn't thought of this as a, as, a, as a further benefit, but the single tax office rather aggressively pursues the legitimacy of what the county or the state, uh, the way it's evaluating uh, the, the uh, piece of property that your leasehold is on and how much they're charging you. Uh, basically, the single tax corporation pays uh, whether it is properly reimbursed or not, but it pursues that it be properly reimbursed, but it takes care of the taxes on all of the land to which it holds title on time every year. Right? And it sees that it is its responsibility to research the accuracy of that so that you really don't have to go to the uh, satellite courthouse and research uh, the way your land, uh, the land to which you are leasing, the way it was appraised. And I think that would also go for the improvements. When the question was asked and Carol responded, you own 100%, obviously, of the value of all of your improvements. So in the widening of Highway 181, people got 100% of the value of their improvements. Okay, And the whole question then is, how should the value of the leasehold be uh, decided? But at any rate, that is a service that the corporation provides and has provided for uh, decades. Uh, it's the legitimacy of the county's uh, evaluation and tax and ta God bless you and uh, uh, tax levied on uh, your property. So it's another contribution. And on the strength of which the IRS uh, gave us a, uh, a 501c4 uh, exemption, we were paying about $150,000 a year until about 2002 or thereabouts because the IRS was recognizing, well, there's all this money coming in, and it, yes, they donated such and so, but we're going to get our piece of the action because somewhere along the line, the membership is going to cash in the value of the property, and there's going to be a windfall fall profit. So we had to prove that we were alleviating the burdens of the municipal government. And one of the specific ways that the IRS specifically noted was that we uh, provide the county with 100% of the uh, value of the, of the taxes every year on time. And then we have to go after uh, uh, delinquencies ourselves on our own dime. But it's getting on into the hour, uh, yes. Do you want to speak to that, Carol? I've been talking a lot. <laughs> um, we do offer this class. Um, we um, ask, we've started asking for the people that take the class that are interested to write a paper. Um, and uh, this year, I'll be giving some tests um, on the understanding. That doesn't, you know, necessarily mean that uh, you agree with everything, but do you understand? 
because we are commotions and we don't always agree. Once we've made our vote, though, we do agree <laughs> and we get along just fine. But um, uh, we, we, and, but, and we encourage people to question and to ask questions. And certainly in the class, you would have the opportunity to do that. Um, after you do that, you are interviewed by the membership committee. And the membership committee asks questions. Um, they, um, if you really want to support single tax or be a part of it, and then they make recommendations to the board. And then the board votes. And um, so that, that's basically how it is done. But we encourage people, I for one, really want people that are uh, members to be involved and be on committees. So we, we like to have new people come in. Uh, new blood is always good. Um, I said I'd, I wanted to run again. My goal was to uh, stay on the board for quite a while because I feel like that I, I understand Henry George and I understand how this community works. We don't exactly go by Henry George, but we, but we do the best that we can to provide uh, services and, and health, education, and welfare and, and uh, for this community that you wouldn't get with just a city. Government. So I, I, I feel that we contribute a lot to this community and I've enjoyed being part of that. Uh, but we encourage, certainly encourage members and people to take the class. That's how you start out. Did we always? Is membership limited to a certain amount of people? No. Mm. No. We are capable of one word answers. <laughs> Usually. <laughs> Excuse me? $100. Uh, yes, it's, it's been $100 for 120 years. Uh, you take an oath, and we, we do feel that oath is important. And um, so we do ask people to really think about that oath when they take it. Uh, but there's no limit to, to the number of members that we have. We wish that our office uh, where we hold our meetings, we're, we're kind of trying to redo that a little bit so that we can have more members come in. We encourage that, um, but, um, and we are working on that. But, yes? Is my uh, understanding correct, since you were the uh, founding entity of Fairco in 1994, were you also the governing entity at that time? Correct. And if not, when did you stop? Yes. We were the governing entity. Right. When did you stop? Uh, when did you become a minister? 1908. In other words, it was, it was the Fairhope Industrial Association right, right. from 1894 to right. 1904. It was then the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation. And it was, the it was a company town, for well or ill, for another four years. So 1908, the, the municipality the of muni Fairhope was founded. No, mm -hmm. uh, you mean the uh, graduated income tax? Yeah. No, that was uh, five years later. Right. Yeah, right. But th there again, more curmudgeons and what have you, and difficulties that people could get land, buy deeded land free, and basically it's been a tension all the way along of people don't have to be members or lessees to enjoy the benefits uh, that the lessees uh, provide. And that's been an argument, well, should we charge or are there uh, specific benefits? And there are specific benefits if you are a lessee. Uh, you do get buried, I think, free except for costs of opening the ground if in the, in the Fairhope Cemetery. Uh, so lessees do have the right to that. And of course, the Single Tax Corporation attempts to uh, direct its uh, expenditures uh, towards the improvement of uh, its lessee's um, property. Incidentally, one other thing, the Blue Book, uh, it's by Al, uh, Blanche and Paul Allier, A-L-Y-E-A, -E that is the history of Fairhope from 1894 to 1954. They said one of the problems was apathy. 
And I was secretary and then president from about 1998 until 1904, and there was a lot of apathy. The committees wouldn't meet, there was stuff like that. And I kind of came back after 10 years away with no involvement at all, not being part of a committee or anything else, and the place is jumping. I mean, the committees are active. Uh, I mean, uh, this the Education Committee, for one, uh, and uh, other committees that are run there on uh, this business, they question about membership and stuff like that. There are a lot of new, active, and I, I was stunned knowing that there are fixed interests and fixed curmudgeons and whatever else at the most recent class that was admitted to membership. I mean, we got some active people. And you know, sometimes an established mentality does not want to rock the boat, and they want things that are kind of going okay and all the rest of that. And you have, you know, people complaining and stuff like that who are not members, and lo and behold, now a bunch of them are members. And I think that's going to be an enormous contribution, which is happening now. Uh, anyway. Yes, it is happening now, and and what's so wonderful about it is that we are able to. Um, we're, we're able to, to have differences. And, um, you know, we're, we're able to argue things out. I might have my mind made up on something and listen to something that someone says and change completely. And some one person on the board that's a real curmudgeon fusses and says, well, I thought you were going to vote the other way. <laughs> so, you know, you, I want to hear what people say. So. Um, and I, and, I, and I want to encourage people to be part of it. And George is a curmudgeon. <laughs> Why, whatever do you mean, Miss? She refers to herself as Miss Carol. I, the phone, I answer the phone, she'll say, this is Miss Carol. And I'm supposed to say, well, bless my soul. Yes, but, uh, occasionally I have palpitations. Yes, <laughs> if, they, if, they get a little, if they get a little too rough <laughs> on us. <laughs> but, anyway, well, uh, maybe another question or so. Yes. Is there some portion Well, it's all, you know, no. those little parcels. There, there are little parcels, hand, hand, yes. Handkerchief. There are little places um, around town that um, we need to clean up. We need to see if, they, if something could be built on them. Edge of a gully. Uh, edge of a gully. Um, that, yes, there are, there are parcels. And um, so we're, we're in the process of looking at those things and um, seeing, seeing if they're worth, I mean, we, we want to clean them up and maintain them. And, um, but you'd be surprised. You would you, be surprised. And maybe you might also, part of your question may imply that there are areas that are leased and therefore they are under the direction of the women or men who have leased them, but are, they are in a process of developing it themselves. That, as you all would know, uh, Fairhope is expanding in all sorts of ways. And so every time you turn around, another pecan grove becomes a development. Yes. So the women and men who do lease are developing uh, their own leaseholds, yes, in all sorts of ways. In fact, where the new Catholic high school is going in, uh, there's a good deal of sink to tax land around that. It's a whole ebbing and flowing of how can we widen the road and do they need a turning lane and who's, who has the say about whether that land is made available to that high school or for the high school's use, although it would be a public land. But generally speaking, the corporation's not developing land itself. No. In fact, that development, um, I, 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 did we acquire, my mind is getting <laughs> foggy, uh, the land where the soccer and the softball complex is next to the high school, the development, Colony Acres or whatever that Col is? Colony Place. Colony Place that is right across uh, the extension of Booth Road. We there. developed that. We developed that, but uh, we did, uh, w that must be uh, land that we acquired that. It was. And it was not previously owned or leased by the corporation. But when we acquired it, it became single tax land and then we uh, put in the roads and made it available. Develop and much less. Well, we developed the infrastructure, yes. right, and we made it available at cost. Because the thought was with no um, um, covenants. So there was some worry, you know, is somebody going to put a purple 
right. polka dot <laughs> house next to my house, and are they going to build a castle, or are they going to build a, a Quonset hut, or what? Uh, so there was some concern about that, but the, the kind of libertarian mentality that was behind the original founding of Fairhope was behind the development of that, that people could kind of do what they wanted to do. And we, we, we d deliberately made it available as inexpensively as possible so that it would be as it was. I've heard from people whose families came back after World War II and basically had access to the land free. They had access to the land free so that all of their um, wherewithal could go into building a house or whatever and then the, uh, the taxing on the uh, property would, would begin. But that was part of the mentality that the land should be made available and should not be held back for speculation. Uh, and that's part of what's behind single tax theory, that whole business about the savanna, the undeveloped savanna, was you would not have uh, speculation on undeveloped land because the rising value of the land was created by the community, not by the speculator. End of high moral tone. You had a question. One last question. Since the single tax colony owns the land, right? Has title to the land. There is by the county and by, um, I think in the building of this library, something affectionately and accurately known as the nut house <laughs> was taken down and it actually processed nuts. It actually was that, a that nut were nuts, factory. Not, 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 not the a present <laughs> population of Fairhope, although it may have fit at that description. But at any rate, we were just, uh, I don't think we were, but there, there was, uh, well, maybe we were chastised that there was, uh, the building was of some historical interest. So um, there are a number of things in place uh, that do protect uh, historic uh, uh, issues. Because there are homes being taken down or raised you know, you know, that have historical significance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Little regard by it. Fairhope does not have a historical no, protection. Yeah. Protection. Yeah. protection. Which is a Which shame. Is yeah. It is central. And the libertarian tone from the beginning even uh, uh, extends to Henry George, who talked about all property should be available for its highest possible use. And when I took the class so many years ago, I said, well, the highest possible use would be to convert all the parks to condominiums. And everyone said, well, no, well, there's a lot of huffing and <laughs> feathers ruffled at that. Um, but of course, it wasn't relevant because Fairhope had already developed and set aside land, and that does continue. So zoning did not exist for Henry George and would not exist for that undeveloped savanna, except insofar as the women and men who created the town put in their zoning. Well, it's getting beyond seven, and uh, as I threatened, we continue talking. Uh, and George and I would talk forever, so we, you need to tell need us to stop. We need to re stop. recognize that. Um, I, I will mention, I did hear from Dean, I mean, from Donnie Baggett today, that the city is right on the edge. So you have an ordinance pending doing because so. of an election year. And if you feel strongly about historical preservation, you need to write it. Sure. Right. But because it's election year, it's interesting, but probably true. <laughs> Sounds like some curmudgeon tone there. You need to join the corporation. You know, right? right, yes. Did you want to say something more about the, did you want to conclude or whatever? It's after seven or?